Hey everyone, I have an exciting stock pick, a dividend stock pick that I want to share with you today because I believe this stock pick is a screaming deep discount value. It is a stock that has been forgotten about. It is a stock that no one really cares about. And it's a stock, quite frankly, that is misunderstood. And what I've found in my investing career, whether I'm investing in dividend stocks, real estate, cryptocurrencies, or really anything, quite frankly, is when there's an asset that is misunderstood, but I'm able to understand it just a little bit better than everyone else through my own analysis, and I'm able to uncover hidden value, those are the screaming buys, those are the deep discounts, those are the exciting opportunities that I love going after. And I also happen to enjoy investing in spinoffs and the very company that I'm talking about today, Viatris, which is actually something that was spun off from Pfizer. Well, Pfizer spun off their Upjohn unit and it combined in a reverse Morris Trust with a company called Mylon to produce the company called Viatris. This is something that happened in late 2020. This is a spin-off of sorts. And Peter Lynch, my favorite investor of all time, he's someone who loves spin-offs as well. And he believes that spin-offs are great investments. I'm gonna talk about that today because I own a few other spin-offs that have performed really well. And so I'm excited about the video today. Before we get started, if you love this channel, if you love dividend investing, I want to kindly ask you to please smash that like button. It really means the world to me. It's something so easy to do and it helps videos like this one reach more people out on YouTube. And also while you're at it, if you could subscribe with the notification bell, it would really help me out. It would mean the world and it would help you out because I have so much content on the way and you really don't want to miss out. And so with all of that, get ready everyone. This is an exciting video today about dividend stock investing. Welcome to PPC Ian. This is Dividend Stock Investing for Everyone. All right, everyone. So I want to start just with this concept of a spin-off because spin-offs have performed really well for me. So check it out on the screen right now. The first thing I want to show is just the five-year chart for Otis Corporation. This was a spin-off from United Technologies, which I also own. It became Raytheon Technologies, but a uh, parent company was called UTX before it uh, they merged with Raytheon. But Otis was a spin-off. This is the elevator company. As you can see, the stock has performed exceptionally well. It's a company that I love holding in my personal portfolio. Next, what I want to share on the screen is Carrier. Check it out right now. Carrier is another spinoff that I personally own. This came, again, from United Technologies when they merged with Raytheon, became Raytheon Technologies. They also spun off Otis and Carrier, as you can see on the screen right now. And Carrier is another example of a fabulous, fabulous spinoff that has performed well for me. Now, Viatris is not performing very well so far. I'm going to share with you on the screen right now. Check out the Viatris stock chart. This is the five-year stock chart. What you, well, The reason it's been around for five years is this company used to be known as Mylon, and what happened is Upjohn merged with Mylon. Upjohn is the spinoff from Pfizer, and they formed a new company called Viatris. But you can basically see that that um, this company has not performed very well at all. And quite frankly, this is a company not only that has underperformed, but it is trading at a very low point, a very, very low point for this company. And when something is trading this low, when something is really under a lot of pressure, it catches my attention as a contrarian investor who likes to hunt for value. So what is Viatris? Check it out on the screen right now. This is just a blurb from the company themselves. And what Viatris is, is it's a new kind of healthcare company. They actually specialize in generics and also biosimilars. They have 1,400 approved molecules. They're working on 
on a variety of new products, new biosimilars. But basically, the purpose of this company is to bring more affordable solutions, more affordable health care to people all around the world. They have 45,000 uh, global workforce. They do business in 165 countries. And it is the combination of Mylon and Pfizer's Upjohn business. And I think this type of company is really important because we all know right now, in 2021, healthcare is very expensive, especially in the United States. We all know right now in 2021, post pandemic type world where the pandemic is coming to an end, people are strapped financially. Finances aren't so good for everyone. And so buying a name brand prescription drug versus the generic, there's a lot of value going in generics right now. And honestly, one of the things about the entire ecosystem of healthcare is when a company discovers a drug and patents it. The patent only lasts for 20 years, and so these drugs are eventually going to go generic anyways. And so having just exposure to generics in the portfolio where I own a lot of healthcare companies, I kind of like that, especially for where we are right now in society and where we are globally right now, and especially in the United States with the healthcare system. So with all of that, I want to share on the screen right now just a quick statement from the CEO of Viatris and just the recent um, the recent literature for shareholders. And basically, what uh, Michael is saying is that this is really the starting point. He basically says we're confident that our financial guidance for 2021 it's the starting point, and we expect 2021 to be our our trough year in terms of revenue, adjusted EBITDA, so on and so forth. And things are only going to get better from there. And so this is really new. And one of the things I would say overall on Beatrice right now is it was difficult to prepare for the video. It was difficult to pull financials because there isn't a lot of financials available on this company. There are no reports yet. There's no quarterly reports. There's no annual reports. If I look at the annual report, it's from 2020. And this transaction only went through at the end of last year. And so really the only meaningful thing I could pull from the annual report was the balance sheet just to get a sense of where the balance sheet stood at the end of the year, which I'm going to share with you next. But what I'm saying is this is a company that the financial analysts don't understand yet. And if the financial analysts don't fully understand it, the average shareholders, the average investors, they don't understand it. And sometimes when there's confusion out there, sometimes when there's misunderstanding out there, I've seen this time and time and time again. That's when I like to strike as an investor when I go for deep value, when I go for undervalued companies. And so with that, check it out on the screen right now. I'll show you really quickly the balance sheet from Beatrice. And so this is end of 2020, and you can see they have about 61 billion in assets. 38 billion in liabilities. So they got some shareholders equity. Under the assets, I would say that there's a heck of a lot of intangible assets and a heck of a lot of goodwill. And so that is something to be careful about. Um, with the assets. It's not necessarily lick all liquid cash, if you will. There's a big chunk of intangibles. And I think one thing that spooks a lot of people about Beatrice right now is that they have a lot of debt. And in particular, they have $22 billion of long-term debt when the market capitalization of this company is only $16 billion. But in my humble opinion, based on where the company is guiding I believe that the debt is something that they will be able to overcome. And right now, thankfully, interest rates are at historically low levels, and I don't think they're going to be going higher or too much higher anytime soon. And so with that, I want to go into some financial guidance from Beatrice. Check it out on the screen right now. And what you can see is they announced recently on February 22nd, their 2021 financial guidance, and they reaffirmed their strategic and financial commitments. And basically in the fine print, what you can see here is that for revenue, they're guiding to a midpoint of $17.5 billion. So right now, this company is basically trading in terms of its market cap, just a little bit lower than revenue. So it's trading at less than one times revenue. Adjusted EBITDA, um, earnings before interest, depreciation, taxes, and amortization is looking to be about $6.2 billion on the midpoint. And the free cash flow is looking to come in at about $2.15 billion. Um, on the midpoint and free cash flow for those that don't know what it is is it's cash from operations but then it subtracts out capital expenditures now in the pharma space capital expenditures typically aren't too high and so it's very similar just to operating cash flow um, more or less but it also subtracts out um, 
cap X. And so I'm going to get into actually an analysis in the video today where I compare a free cash flow multiple on Viatris versus um, others in the space such as AbbVie and Pfizer for that matter. So we'll look at that in a minute. But before I do that, I want to give some more information that came out of the company recently. Check it out on the screen right now. And so what they said is they're going to be initiating a 2021 dividend. And um, so Viatris doesn't pay a dividend now. Because of that, it's not on a lot of dividend investors' radars. Well, it's on my radar because I own it already because it was spun out of Pfizer and I knew all along that there was going to be a dividend. That was something that was discussed during those um, early days of this um, reverse Morris Trust transaction. And it's nice to see that materializing. They're going to be soon announcing a dividend that's expected to be about 11 cents uh, per share per quarter. And that would actually, based on the current share price, place the starting dividend yield around 3.15%. So not a huge starting dividend, but um, something. And that's something that could move in the right direction. What I also love about this guidance is the company is saying that they expect to repay approximately $6.5 billion in debt by the end of 2023. And so if you look at that per year, it looks like based on just cash flows that they have right now, they're going to be able to pay down about $2 billion per year in debt. And so clearly, in my humble opinion, yeah, this company has a lot of debt. We just saw it on the balance sheet. But the company is in a position where they're saying in 2021 and beyond, not only are we going to be able to pay a dividend, but in addition to paying that dividend, we're going to have enough money left over to pay down debt on the order of about $2 billion per year. And so that's really exciting to see um, from this company. I think things are really moving in the right direction and they're going to pay down the debt. And so with that, I want to share my financial analysis. Check it out on the screen right now. And what you see is I stack up Viatris versus some other competitors, AbbVie and Pfizer. But what I also do is I include Altria. The reason I include Altria on their quite frankly, is I look at Viatris as a bargain basement company. And I want to compare it to the other companies in my portfolio right now that I believe are at bargain basement levels. And um, those other companies are AbbVie, Pfizer, and Altria. There's some others, but these are the ones that really come to mind. And so Viatris, I can't really get great metrics yet because the analysts are just starting to analyze this. The metrics aren't even available in easy to digest format. I'm waiting for their first few 10 Qs to come out to really dig into it. But what I've found, again, as an investor is sometimes if I move before those first uh, 10 Qs are out, I get first mover advantage, or advantage when no one understands this thing. And so basically the analysts do think that this thing is going to earn 250 this year to 366 next year, which would place the PE at a 5 in 2021 and a 3.82 in 2022. Personally, I'm a little bit skeptical about these numbers. Um, maybe, they, like I said, Said, maybe the analysts just don't fully understand things yet. But if these numbers are real, this um, is, like I said, the, the sale of a lifetime. And so <laughs> I'm really excited about it. But what I'm leaning on a little bit more is this free cash flow multiple, because that's what I do know. That came directly out of the company, whereas this PE ratios are based on analyst estimates. And I don't even know if the analysts are right here. So when I go down to the free cash flow, we know the mid-range of the guidance is 2.15 billion. And so the multiple the uh, of basically market cap to um, free cash flow guidance gives me a free cash flow multiple of about 7.84. And so you also see the dividend there, 3.15% as well. But I'm not so concerned about dividend right now on this thing. I'm more concerned about just understanding where it's valued because the dividend will follow. The dividend will stack over the years. Now with AbbVie, by contrast, this company is still even at a PE or at a price of $108. The PE is up uh, only to an 8 this year and a 7.8 next year. So AbbVie is still bargain basement even at the current share price. And what I would say though on AbbVie is I, I don't have forward guidance on free cash flow. So I used backwards guidance or backwards free cash flow. I pulled the free cash flow myself from their 2020 um, 10K. But basically I get a free cash flow multiple of 11.38. So you can quickly see that even something that is as bargain basement as AbbVie, Viatris is trading even lower. Now, to be fair, 
Beatrice and AbbVie are not apples to apples comparable. AbbVie is a company on a rapid ascendancy. So not only is it trading at a bargain price, but it's growing really quickly. Will Beatrice grow? Yes. Will it grow as quickly as AbbVie? Certainly not. And so there's always going to be a valuation discount for something like that. Also, of course, free cash flow multiple, that doesn't take debt servicing into effect as well. So that's pre-debt service. And again, I don't have a lot of metrics on this yet. I don't fully know yet what it's going to cost them to service their debt, how they're going to structure their debt, so on and so forth. It's going to take me more time to digest upcoming, forthcoming earnings releases, 10 Qs, 10 Ks, when they're available, but they're just not even available yet. And so there's some pricing discrepancy between Beatrice and AbbVie, but obviously AbbVie would be more expensive, but should it be as expensive as it is compared to Beatrice? No. And are both undervalued? Yes, let's keep going. Check it out on the screen right now. So the next one I want to show you is just Pfizer. Pfizer is the parent company that spun off up, John. It's trading at a PE now of 10.88 this year, 11.92 next year. It's um, trading at a, actually, I don't have a free cash flow multiple on that one. And I did not pull backwards looking free cash flow on Pfizer just because that would not make sense because the 2020 Pfizer had up John for most of the year, which was the one spun off. So it's hard to compare Pfizer on a free cash flow multiple, but you can at least see on a PE multiple, the PEs um, are much higher uh, than Beatrice, as they should be because Pfizer is the company that is developing new drugs. It's the one, the reason they spun off Upjohn is they want to focus on drugs that are either under patent or that they're developing. And so that's a different company. It will be at a more premium valuation. It's a quicker growing company. But should the PE in 2021 be double what uh, Beatrice is? I don't think so. And quite frankly, I think Pfizer is drastically undervalued here. I think it's all of these stocks are interesting buys for me, at least right now. With that, check it out on the screen right now. I want to show you Altria really quickly. So Altria Altria is um, a company that's not growing very quickly. It's an industry that's not really uh, rapidly increasing. Maybe it will when uh, they they get heavy into cannabis and that industry takes off. But for now, it's not growing very quickly. It's stagnating. And so Altria is trading at a PE this year of 11, next year 10. Uh, again, deep discount in my humble opinion. And the free cash flow multiple on um, Altria... Uh, looking backwards at 2020 is an 11. So again, you can see, I think Altria is an interesting comp for Beatrice because Beatrice, let's assume it's not even growing much. It's kind of in the camp of Altria. And Altria carries a whole bu bunch of risk being in the sin stock industry. You've got a free cash flow multiple of 11.66 versus a free cash flow multiple of 7.84. And again, these aren't perfect metrics. It's not a perfect way to compare everything, but it's the best I have right now based on what the company gave me. And I'm comfortable enough knowing all of these are deep discounts that Beatrice is the bargain of the bunch even. It's the cheapest valued of the bunch. And so with that, I want to get into just some summary. Like what am I thinking about Beatrice now? What am I doing with Beatrice? So check it out on the screen right now. What you see in front of you is my summary checklist. And basically it's in a many year downtrend. My lawn was stagnating, failing before even this whole Upjohn reverse Morris transaction. And so it's had many years of downtrend. In fact, the combined uh, Mylon Upjohn, which is Beatrice, is trading at similar prices to where Mylon on its own was back in 2009. We're in 2021 people. And, um, the post Upjohn transaction is trading lower than where Mylon was trading even before the Upjohn transaction. And Upjohn is bringing a lot of value over to, um, uh, to Beatrice. There's a lot of just misunderstanding. It's a complex situation. So I think when investors don't understand something, they just stay away from it. And when there's negative sentiment, they stay away from it. There's a lot of like EpiPen controversy with Mylon. And I think there, that still kind of sticks with the company and, um, uh, so it's so that negativity sticks with the company to this day. Um, I look at it as a contrarian investment. Am I going to put a ton of money in this? Is it going to become my number one position? No, but right now it's a very small position because there wasn't a huge amount of shares that were spun off from Pfizer. So just kind of bringing it up to size in my portfolio based on the analysis I've done here is a nice little contrarian investment, nice little kind of supporting role um, investment. I'm happy to do it. 
I would say there's lots of debt, but thankfully the interest rates are low. I would say the low PE is, is ridiculously low. The free cash flow multiple is ridiculously low. The company is telling me they're going to pay down $6 billion in debt over the next three years in addition to paying the dividend. And so that tells me they've got some great cash flow coming through that they're going to be able to use to extinguish some of that debt. And so that's really nice to see. And also, I believe the company is going to grow their business. And um, I think it's it's a climate right now that is ready for something like this. I would say it's cheaper than other ridiculous, ridiculously cheap stocks. And my theory is, look, it's going to appreciate over time once the company is understood and gets some momentum. I think once the debt is paid down, once some 10 Qs start coming through, once people understand the thing, I think the stock will appreciate. And until then, I'm okay with it, um, buying it at these very low bargain basement levels. Not huge amounts, but buying some of it as a nice little turnaround play. Uh, more exposure to healthcare in my portfolio, which I think is a really important part of my portfolio that I love having exposure to. I think the generics and biosimilars business is... Um, great for cost conscious consumers. And um, I already own some. I would say to, to for me, in my dividend stock portfolio, I own 50 stocks. I either own, I'm either in or I'm out. Right now, Beatrice, it's kind of in this halfway position. It's kind of like, hey, it's a small position because it was spun off. And yeah, if it just went up on its own, like Otis and Carrier, it would become like more than full size because those ones went up so much. But um I don't like having a position in my 50 stock portfolio where it's like kind of halfway there. I'm either in it or I'm out of it. And based on my analysis and based where the price is now, I am in it. And so I'm going to be buying some more Beatrice in the morning tomorrow. I'm excited about that. And I'll probably add to it over the next few weeks if it stays at these low levels. I don't want to buy this thing really at anywhere too much higher than where it is. But if it's trading at $13, $14, $15, somewhere in that range, I like buying it. And sometimes people ask me on my channel, Ian, are there any low priced dividend stocks out there? I don't really think share price matters, to be honest, because you can buy fractional shares now in the United States, at least with most of the major platforms or brokers out there. And so you don't have to buy a full share if you can't afford it. And with free commissions, it kind of makes this idea of low share price stocks not that important. But I still get the question nonetheless. And Beatrice, quite frankly, it's a low share price stock. So I guess it just feeds the ego because you can get a lot of shares of this thing at these prices. But again, share price, it doesn't really matter other than just being kind of fun to have more shares. Before I close out today, I do have a few more things. I want to dig into AbV really quickly to answer some subscriber questions. But before I do that, I want to let all of you know I'm over on Patreon. I will link to this in the pinned comment below. And if you want more bonus content from uh, me, I have 25 videos over there on Patreon, and if you sign up, um, it starts as low as $3 per month. You get access to all 25 of those videos from day one, and so there's some really good videos. I just uploaded one that's 28 minutes long that goes over my recap of what I accomplished in Q1, what I'm trying to accomplish in Q2, not only in my investing, but in my life, and so some good stuff there, and a bunch of free kind of handouts and uh, value-added content as well, in addition to those videos and you could join 150 other subscribers over there as well and growing. It's a really great community on Patreon and I would be forever grateful because it does help support my efforts here. Also, I'll include in the pinned comment my custom dividend investing uh, merch store as well. I've got some really cool merch. Also, just in case you don't know, I have a brand new YouTube channel about earning passive income in cryptocurrency. I'll link to that in the pinned comment as well. It's gaining a lot of traction and momentum. I'd love to see you over there. And uh, with all of that, I want to answer some questions about AbV really quickly because people oftentimes ask me, Ian, why is your price earnings ratio on AbV different than what I'm seeing on Yahoo Finance? And so check it out on the screen right now. I want to do this really quickly because this is something that comes up in this pharmaceutical space quite a bit. So as you can see on the screen right now, what I'm showing you is a recent press release from AbbVie. This is their full year 2020 results. And you can see at all the bold print kind of at the bottom, it says they provide 2021 gap diluted EPS range of 669 to 689, but they provide 2021 adjusted diluted in the range of 1232 to 1252. And so basically the difference between the PE 
you're seeing on Yahoo and the PE I'm using is you're probably looking at the gap one, which is a lot lower, generally accepted accounting principles. I'm looking at adjusted diluted. And the reason I'm looking at adjusted diluted is there's something in the EPS that's throwing it off called contingent consideration. So I want to show that really quickly. Check it on the screen right now. And so as you can see on the screen right now, this is the cash flow statement from Abvi. And as you can see at the top in the cash flows from operating activities, and there's a line item in there for quite a bit of money that says change in fair value of contingent consideration liabilities. And it's $5.7 billion that gets added back to uh, the, the net earnings. And so what this basically means, this is actually a non-cash charge. So AbbVie has a blockbuster drug called Skyrosy. It's going through the roof. And um, I personally think this one is going to make up for any lack of sales or declining sales in Humira. And um, basically what uh, is happening with Skyrosy is the deal that they made when they acquired this drug had something called contingent consideration. And so they basically acquired the company. They, they paid money for it. Um, but there's parts of the money that were held back and that money that was held back is only paid out um, to whomever they bought Skyrosy from when certain marks are met, certain milestones are met in terms of sales volume. And since Skyrosy is doing so well, finally this contingent consideration is getting uh, released. But basically it doesn't affect their ongoing uh, cash flow. It doesn't affect their ongoing earnings. It's something that factors in to the gap EPS. But again, this is something that was already earmarked. This is something that was already set aside. This is something that's part of an acquisition, which doesn't affect day-to-day -day operations of the company. So when I look at Abvi, I choose to look at the adjusted diluted EPS because it makes up for that contingent consideration that throws things off. And so that's just a quick note on Abvi. All right, everyone. Before we end the video today, I want to kindly ask you to please smash that like button. It really means the world to me. Also, again, please don't forget to subscribe with notification bell. And if you have not subscribed, I know who you are because when I read all the comments, it actually shows who is subscribed and who has not. And so if you want me to spend even more attention kind of looking for your comment or there's so many comments I try to get to them all but it's not always possible if you subscribe when I'm scrolling through all the comments and trying to type responses I always look for those ones with the subscriptions first and so just another reason to subscribe to the channel I love you all. Before I leave today, in terms of full disclosure, I am long Raytheon Technologies, ticker symbol RTX. I am long Otis, ticker symbol OTIS. I am long Carrier, ticker symbol CARR. I am also long Viatris, ticker symbol VTRS. I am long ABV, ticker symbol ABBV. I am long Pfizer, ticker symbol PFE, and Altria, ticker symbol MO. Also, before I leave today, in terms of a friendly disclaimer, today's video is not investment advice. I'm not a licensed financial advisor. Today's video is just for your fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult your licensed financial advisor first. I'm just sharing my journey here on YouTube for fun and entertainment. Investing in the market carries a lot of risk, especially in something like Viatris, where the numbers, it's kind of, no one knows the numbers until the next kind of 10Q, the first 10Q comes out of these people and uh, we get a few t uh, t uh, 10 cues under under our belts and start understanding what this company is about. And so I'm kind of going on what I know, what I've been able to gather so far. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching the video. I'll see you in the comments section below and I hope you have a wonderful day.